a soundbar, two subwoofers, and four surround speakers. The Nakamichi Shockwave Ultra 9.2.4 is one of the largest and most powerful soundbar systems out there. What's up guys, Jonah Mathis here. So as I've already said, today we're looking at the Nakamichi Shockwave Ultra. It's the top dog of Nakamichi Shockwave lineup. Below it is the Shockwave Pro with 7.1.4 channels of audio and the Shockwave Elite with 7.2.4 channels of audio. This is the one and only 9.2.4 channel soundbar system out there as of right now. The only system that comes close to this one in terms of channel supported is the Samsung HWQ950T, which has 9.1.4 channels of audio, but it only has a single set of surround speakers. So this system is truly one of a kind. In the box, you get the soundbar, two subwoofers, four surround speakers, power adapter for the soundbar, power cables for the subwoofers, four RCA cables for the surround speakers, an HDMI cable, digital optical cable, and 3.5 millimeter auxiliary cable. It also comes with mounting hardware for the soundbar and surround speakers, this large and extensive remote control, and a very detailed user manual. The soundbar itself has an interesting shape to it. While most other soundbars are rectangular, the shockwave is wider in the back than it is in the front. The back side is made out of plastic and the front and sides have a metal grill covering them. There are pairs of two, two and a half inch speaker drivers for the left, center, and right channels. Then there's a single one inch high frequency tweeter on each end that is used for surround effects. These aim to bounce sound off of the walls and off of the ceiling. There's an LED display in the very center of the soundbar that displays your volume level, what input you're selected on, and helps adjust its various settings. On the top are five clicky buttons, power, input, demo, volume down, and volume up. And it's pretty light, weighing in at a little over seven pounds. The two subwoofers each have a 10 inch down firing subwoofer with a port on the back to help reduce pressure inside the enclosure. And of course, they both wirelessly connect to the soundbar. The subwoofers are designated as left and right. So pay attention to this when placing them in your setup. On the back of each is where you will connect the surround speakers. There's an RCA connection for the surround and back speaker on each subwoofer. And they weigh in right at 19 pounds each. Speaking of surround speakers, these things are also extremely unique in how they are designed. They have the same silver color that is on the soundbar and a black metal grill as well. Each one has a three inch full range driver and a one inch high frequency tweeter. This helps them produce a wide range of frequencies despite them being pretty compact. These are also labeled for exactly where they should be placed. So left or right to designate which side they should be placed on and surround or back to designate if they should be placed beside or behind the main seating area. Pay attention to these stickers, they are important. But what's most interesting about these speakers is that they can be oriented in many different ways. Option number one is how most people would think to place them, vertically with the rubber pad going down. Option number two gives you what they call hybrid 360 surround with vertical effects. Option three gives you the most vertical effects possible and option four is what's called a dipole setup. It comes with the hardware to attach the speakers like this, and it's best if you're only able to place both of the speakers in a single location on each side of the main seating area. We'll talk about these different placements a little more later on in the video. Before we move on, make sure you guys smash the like button on this video. This helps with the YouTube algorithm and makes it so my videos can be seen by more people. I'd really appreciate it. What's nice about the soundbar is that it has a ton of different connections available. There's a total of three HDMI inputs. This is more than almost any other soundbar out there. All of these HDMI inputs support up to 4K at 60 frames per second, Dolby Vision, and HDR pass-through. And of course, it has an HDMI out or HDMI arc port. Unfortunately, this is not HDMI eARC or enhanced audio return channel. So make sure you connect your higher end media devices to the HDMI inputs. Otherwise you'll be limited to Dolby Digital Plus, which is a compressed audio codec. With a system this extensive and powerful, you don't want to limit it to Dolby Digital Plus when watching Blu-rays or streaming high quality content. It also has a digital optical, digital coax, and 3.5 millimeter auxiliary input. There's a USB port you can use for music playback and firmware updates. And finally, it does have Bluetooth built into it. But unfortunately, you aren't able to stream music to the system via Wi-Fi, unless you're doing so through another connected device. So if you're big on streaming music via Chromecast or AirPlay, then this may be a big downside for you. 
Setting up the system is fairly simple, but can take some time to do. Simply connect your media devices to the HDMI inputs on the soundbar, then connect the soundbar to the TV via the HDMI out or HDMI arc port. Then connect the power to the soundbar. Now for the subwoofers and surround speakers. The subwoofer labeled left goes to the left side of the main seating area when you're facing the TV, and the same goes for the right subwoofer. Using the extremely long RCA cables that comes with this system, you'll need to connect the surround speakers to their designated subwoofer. This is pretty easy to match up, just read the labels on the back of the surround speakers and connect them to the same port on the subwoofer. Then connect both subwoofers to power and flip the rocker switch on. Once they're powered on, they will begin pairing to the soundbar. You'll know that they have been successfully paired when the LED on the back stays lit up blue. So that's simple enough. Everything should be working properly and you're good to go. Well, let's hold on a second. I haven't talked much about this yet, but there's a ton of different settings that you can adjust on this system. I mean, just by looking at the remote control, you'll likely get overwhelmed with everything that you can adjust. I want to touch on some of the most important settings and features, but I'm definitely not covering all of them. If you're interested in that, then I would really recommend that you read the user manual because it kind of breaks everything down for you. So here are the biggest things that I would adjust as you're watching your favorite type of content. If you're like me, you may notice a lot of cutting out of the subwoofers and surround speakers. If you're in a condensed area with lots of Wi-Fi access points, then it's possible that you'll experience similar issues. But don't worry, Nakamichi provides a great solution for this. Make sure you're using firmware 35 or higher, and you'll want to enable dedicated frequency. To do this, press the setup button until you see DF off, and then press the left or right arrow key to change it to DF on. After doing this, I almost never hear the subwoofers or surround speakers cut out. Next, you'll wanna adjust the SSE mode. SSE is the spatial surround and elevation processing technology that's built into the system. There are four different levels available here. Setting it to zero will disable vertical surround effects. And levels one through three are based on how far the soundbar and surround speakers are from your main seating area. For me, they're pretty close, so I set this to one. Similar to SSE, it has a few presets for the size of your room, small, medium, and large. It has a helpful diagram of the recommended sizes in the user manual. There's also quite a few audio presets such as movie, music, games, news, and sports. Try cycling through these to hear what sounds best for you. Now this next feature is awesome. Unfortunately, most content isn't recorded or delivered in 9.2 channels of audio but by pressing the direct button, you can cycle through options for mapping or upmixing the audio channels. For Dolby and PCM content, you can set it to native where it does no upmixing at all, probably don't want that, Dolby Upmix where it upmixes audio to all channels, or Dolby Surround where it upmixes with vertical surround effects. I suggest trying this one out. And for DTS content, it has similar settings as well. As I've already mentioned, in order to play music to the system wirelessly, you'll need to use Bluetooth, which is not the best in terms of quality or stream it through another connected device. Otherwise, you can connect your device to the auxiliary input if you'd like. Now by default, when playing music, it only plays in stereo mode. So basically only from the soundbar and subwoofers, not the surround speakers. To change this, press the S or stereo button on the remote to change it to all channel stereo mode. It will now play music to the four surround speakers as well. This completely changes the music listening experience. You can hear music from all directions, and if you're big into music, you're gonna absolutely love this. Now speaking more on the quality of audio produced, the soundbar itself has a pretty flat sound to it. Comparing it to other high-end soundbar systems, the low-end and high-end frequencies of the soundbar are not very impressive. However, the mid-range does perform beautifully. The subwoofers have a lot of punch to them. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot, like almost too much to be honest. I live above people, so I couldn't listen to music at a very loud volume without the subwoofer shaking the entire ground. And that's what the bass turned all the way down, by the way. I've listened to a lot of soundbar systems with wireless subwoofers, and these two by far have the most punch to them. But that doesn't translate well to overall clarity. You can definitely feel the bass, but can't necessarily hear it very clearly. It's hard to make out what they're actually playing. So I think this can definitely come down to personal preference. Some people want a ton of kick and oomph from the subs, while others may want overall clarity without a lot of kick to it. The surround speakers do a great job of filling in the gaps from the soundbar. Because they have a three inch woofer and one inch tweeter, they're able to play a wide range of frequencies, which helps balance out the entire system. Although I did find myself cranking them all the way up with the remote because they were difficult to hear clearly at times. 
overall, if you're a fan of listening to music and more of a surround environment, you're gonna love listening to music on this system. The main and obvious downside is the lack of built-in wireless streaming capabilities past Bluetooth. Now for surround sound quality. I'll start this off by saying this system creates an extremely immersive surround sound listening environment. It really is incredible. For surround sound testing, I went with what Nakamichi calls a hybrid elevation setup. So the side speakers are mounted vertically and the back speakers are mounted with the speakers firing upwards. In a larger room, I could have mounted the back speakers as option number two so that they were pointing up at a less steep angle. But since my room is smaller, this is the best option for me. I watched a lot of scenes from both Avengers Infinity War and Mad Max Fury Road to see how well the system performed in various aspects. Now, as I've mentioned already, the soundbar does a great job with producing the mid-range frequencies, not so much with the lower and higher frequencies. You can clearly hear dialogue even when there's lots of explosions and other sound effects going on. This is something that really surprised me about this system. The tweeters on the sides of the soundbar do a great job of widening the soundstage. I could not clearly hear the sound bouncing off the ceiling, but I could definitely hear the sound bouncing off the walls. Again, the subwoofers can sometimes overpower other aspects of this system. They're so loud and punchy, but yet there isn't much depth to the sound that they produce, at least in my opinion. Now that's not saying that they're bad. I really like these subwoofers. I enjoy feeling the ground rumble when a big explosion goes off in a movie. They really do a great job of immersing you into what you're watching. But for someone who is more of an audiophile, you likely won't be impressed with them. However, I think the average consumer will have almost zero complaints about them. The surround speakers really tie this system together. In the past, I didn't speak too highly about them, but I don't think that came out exactly how I wanted. When you position them correctly in a room, they can fully immerse you into a movie. I think you'll definitely need to adjust the positioning and levels for the surround speakers, but once you get them just right, it sounds incredible. For immersiveness, it's honestly one of my favorites. The quality of audio that comes from these surround speakers isn't incredible, but because of how loud they can get and how immersive they can make movies feel, I don't think it subtracts from their performance at all. The overhead sound effects will certainly vary depending on how you have configured your surround speakers. As I mentioned already, I have my side speakers mounted normally and the back speakers firing upwards. So for a fairly small room with a flat ceiling, the overhead sound effects are very noticeable. They're not as good as some other Dolby Atmos and DTSX systems that I've tested, but I think they're good enough to satisfy the average person. Now, if you have a very open room with a high or vaulted ceiling, they may not perform well at all. This is likely the case for all systems that aim to bounce sound off of the ceiling. If that's the case for you, I'd suggest placing both sets of surround speakers normally. This will maximize the surround effects that you get from the system. Overall, for a soundbar system, this thing gets pretty darn close to a true home theater experience, depending on the room that it's in, of course. Now, the audio quality itself may not be on the same level as a traditional surround sound system. The Nakamichi Shockwave Ultra still performs phenomenally. So far, I've spoken pretty highly of this system. You should already know what I love about it but I do want to take a minute to talk about some of its downsides. Number one, the system is not the best option for everyone in terms of its components and size. For an open living room, it will be difficult to place the surround speakers correctly without them looking awkward or out of place. For those of you with significant others, try placing a surround speaker on a stand in the middle of your living room. This is not gonna go over well for you. The subwoofers are also very large, so if you have a smaller room, it may be difficult to place them where you want them. Number two, the soundbar itself in terms of audio quality and overhead sound effects isn't as impressive as some other comparable systems. I did a big comparison video of six different high-end Dolby Atmos soundbar systems not too long ago, where I looked at this system along with the Sonos Arc, Samsung HWQ950T, Vizio Elevate, JBL Bar 9.1, and LG SN11RG. I compared them all in just about every aspect that I could think of, so definitely check that video out if you're interested. Link in the description. Number three, I wish this system had a mobile app and wireless streaming to go along with it. I hate having to deal with multiple remote controls and so does my fiance. We'd much prefer to have an app over using another remote. Yes, you can use HDMI CEC or a universal remote to adjust the volume levels, but I'd love to be able to do so with my phone. And I'm not big into music, but I know a lot of people are. Only being able to use Bluetooth to wirelessly play music is a big turnoff. One, in terms of user experience, and two, in terms of audio quality sent over Bluetooth. And lastly, as much as I love the punchiness of these subwoofers, they just don't provide the same level of clearness that a few others do. 
But again, I think this is more of a personal preference thing. It may not apply to all people. Other than those things, I love everything else about this system. If you're looking for something that's as close as you can get to a traditional surround system without dealing with the receiver and difficulty of running the cables all the way to the back of your room, then this is a great option for you. And for the price of $1,400, I'd say it's an incredible deal. Now, if there's anything that I missed in this video or you have any questions, make sure you leave a comment down below. If you enjoyed the video and felt that the information I provided was useful, consider subscribing to the channel. I make lots of videos on sound bars, home entertainment technology, and more. And lastly, make sure you smash the like button if you haven't already. Now, with all that said, I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.